Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Solutions to the Dropout Crisis. I'm Sam Drew. I'm happy to be with you, and I'm here with my co-host, Terry Cash and Marty Duckenfield for this special edition of Solutions. It's a special edition because today we're celebrating our 25th anniversary as a center. And um, actually, I think the the day is is the 26th, which is tomorrow. So we're doing this a little early. Um, But uh, as always, the National Dropout Prevention Center brings you this monthly radio webcast in partnership with Clemson Radio Productions here at Clemson and the generous support of Catapult Learning and Penn Foster. And I just uh, I want to add uh, on this 25th anniversary um, how appreciative we are really to Catapult Learning and Penn Foster. They started with us four years ago, and they have stayed with us the entire time and supported this program. And we think the program has really made a difference. Uh, we hear from our listeners uh, about how they're using these programs. We think it's made a real difference out there. And so we really appreciate uh, Catapult Learning and Penn Foster. Absolutely. Um, and I want to th- add my thanks to no one could be a better supporter than uh, those two organizations, for sure. But isn't it fun being here for our 25th anniversary, Terry? Isn't this great? Well, Marnie, I'm just pleased to be with you as always. And uh, it's an exciting program. It, uh, we have put it all together to, to talk about the, uh, to show how the 15 strategies fit together and how they've worked. And we've got some wonderful guests on with us today. So it's going to be an exciting program. It's, and this yeah. is a first, too, for all three of us oh, to be trying here. A different, <laughs> a different format today, but um, with, with all three of us here, hopefully we'll be able to carry it. But I'm really excited about this 20th anniversary program, 25th anniversary Mm -hmm. program. Um, It's a great time to reflect on what we've tried to do with these radio webcasts and what a lineup we have, an all-star cast. Oh, absolutely. Crystal Star Award winners, editors of newsletters. These are people in our network. I mean, we celebrate not only the center, but the members of our National Dropout Prevention Network. Here they are, and some of them are here with us today. And I think most importantly, those who have actually used the research in a, in a, a very practical application of it and, and can suggest to the listeners that, yes, these strategies do indeed work. Absolutely, Terry. And, and another point I think we want to make is that we are celebrating because uh, we've, we've spent 25 years now, uh, not us personally, um, but, but some people that we'll mention have, um, working in the field, uh, out with all of you, um, and we do celebrate that, but we're also moving forward, and we want you to know that. As with any organization, there's always room for improvement, and we're looking at uh, ways to, to move forward into the future. We, we know we'll focus more on research to practice and getting that information out to you with useful tools, things that you can actually use, better use of technology to get information out to you and, and programs and tools and um, and, uh, and and the, the whole area of strategic partnerships also is another one. Um, Catapult Learning and Penn Foster is a good example of that, supporting this program. But we're looking for strategic partners who want to work with us over the long haul so that we can be more effective in the, in the work that we do. So the past four years um, have been designed of the solutions broadcast, have been designed to, uh, to really home in on specific strategies found in our Effective Strategies Framework. All of you know about the 15 strategies. And so um, today's program really is one where we uh, hope to step back a little um, and to revisit that framework, really, and to, to understand how each of those strategies integrates into a comprehensive approach. You know, we've sort of s- split them apart, and we've had good programs over the last four years on each of those strategies, and we'll have more. But we thought it would would be important, really, for you to see how all of those strategies fit together and that when you use all of them um, uh, and integrate them into a comprehensive approach, how much more effective that would be. So today we have with us our colleagues Deb Dillon, Mary Caputo, Rob Schumer, and Pat O'Connor, and they're sort of waiting in the phone lines, wings, uh, (laughs) so to speak. So uh, we're really appreciative that they are, are with us today. They're people who are working in the field in these various areas and can really talk to these areas better than we can. And we'll introduce each of them as we um, bring them online. 
Well, I'd like to uh, do my usual role here about pointing out to our listeners, and we do welcome the new listeners who are with us today. Uh, you're going to get the overview your first time through. But we put on the website uh, all the resources that you need for the program, either before, during, or after. And as far as during, you need to have that PowerPoint open. Uh, we've constructed a, a brief PowerPoint for you, but that does support uh, the program that we've planned for you today. So have that open and ready. Uh, I want to point out a couple of special things since we are ce celebrating the 25th anniversary. One is a video that kind of gives you the history of the center in the past, but also where we're going in the future. So we're kind of pleased with that. We have our newsletter up there as well, so you can find out about our history. And, and some of these pioneers we've talked about, um, certainly we want to mention some of them at, at this juncture, perhaps the people that we... Uh, kind of salute today for our history. And, uh, you know, Terry, I think you had some particular thoughts you wanted to mention on uh, some of the pioneers of our center and our network. Oh, of course. I mean, how could you not talk about the National Dropout Prevention Center and, and mention uh, Dr. Jay Smink? I mean, clearly he has been a mentor for all of us and has um, uh, there have been many others who have worked in conjunction with this area, but Jay has certainly um, uh, created the foundation and for who we are and what we've done. And, of course, yeah, and Jay Franklin. really picked up the ball and ran with it. Yeah. And he was here for over 23 years um, at a time really when – the issue was was awareness, but he took it way beyond that and really built the center into what it is today. Yeah, so, so we salute him today. And we, and of course we uh, we appreciate the fact that he put first uh, he brought together such a fine team and those, uh, <laughs> those what a great team <laughs> those who brought to bear the strengths uh, yes. that that would uh, uh, carry forward. So and then of course Franklin Shargell who who has long been a supporter and uh, brought a, a great deal of expertise to the center. Yeah, and I think it was 2001 uh, when Jay and Franklin actually uh, wrote the first book on the 15 strategies, which really got, got it out into the field. It, those are uh, great resources because the second one, we actually have that listed here uh, for people to uh, get, but we all were involved in working on that one. But really uh, filling out from people from the field and ourselves and other staff those 15 strategies. So that book has just been made a huge difference all across this country. And there's so many other people that had uh, so much to do really with the very uh, beginning of the center. And uh, you can learn about all of those by watching that video that um, Marty mentioned. Absolutely. Yes, they are historic figures, and we, we appreciate and salute them today. Um, and as we move into the real topic of our uh, actually content now with the effective strategies. There are a lot of good links there for you as well. Should you like to use this particular program later for professional development, we have included, for example, a PDF that we use, which has the 15 strategies on it, um, which you can use as a handout. Uh, and then there is also the whole website. We see this is the tip of the iceberg. Sure. Yeah, we were talking earlier. Our website really is the main resource. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've got the solutions program. programs. We've got the model programs database. There's just everything supports uh, this framework of the effective strategy. So uh, let's get started. I mean, we can wax eloquently about our history and what we have on the website, but I think our listeners are probably going to be ready to start learning a little bit about what this framework is. And now we want you to know that this is a radio webcast. It's a call-in show, and perhaps you would like to have a comment or a question of each of our presenters. It's going to be, the program is going to be in segments, and so um, I recommend that if you do have a comment that you'd like to make to each presenter, call during their time on the line, and then you can actually interact with them or you know add to what they're saying. The toll-free number is 888-539-8859. And if you're calling from outside the United States, the number is 864-656-4549. So um, we also um, hope that, uh, that you will either call in or send emails at our ndpc at clemson.edu mm -hmm. email address. I'm watching for those. And, uh, Marty, we started um, last year, I think, for the first time ah. with um, trying to entice our uh, more people to call in and participate in this program. We um, 
had um, a drawing at the end of the year for everyone who called in. We put their name in a hat, and we drew a name out of that hat, and we gave them a free conference registration to the conference in Chicago, and we're going to continue that this year. Um, that was very successful. We heard from um, Josh Gudat, who uh, was last year's winner and attended the Chicago conference and uh, wrote and, 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 um, and, and thanked us for that uh, opportunity. And we thank him, really, for participating in this program. And so we invite uh, any of you to call in, give us your comments, um, and, um, and be eligible for a drawing at the end of this year for um, our national conference, which will be held in Orlando, Florida, uh, in October of next year. Oh, that would be nice. Doesn't that sound yeah. good? Doesn't that sound good? <laughs> so, uh, callers, and thank you, Josh, again, for calling in. And, and it was great to hear from him because they're already implementing some things they learned at the conference, and that's always good to hear. So we recommend that you call. We love our callers, and they add a lot of spice to the program. So, again, that toll-free number, write it down, is 888-539-8859. And outside the U.S., 864-656-4549. Well, let's move forward um, and get into the meat of our program. Um, if, if you will move to, I think it's slide four, um, you'll see a, um, a, a yellow, red, green, and blue graphic there. And that graphic really is the framework for the 15 strategies. And when we're out in the field doing presentations about these strategies and how um, schools and school districts can implement these strategies to increase their graduation rates and reduce their dropout rates, we usually present this graphic first because it's important, I think, for everyone to understand that these 15 strategies all fit together. Yes, you can pull a strategy or two here or there and apply that in a particular way, and, and many people do that. But the most effective use of these strategies really um, is, as is depicted um, in, in, this, uh, in this graphic. Um, you'll notice around the edge, um, actually there are three kind of overarching strategies um, and they are, in, in many ways, the most important of the strategies. Uh, one, around the edge there, being systemic renewal. Um, school community collaboration is that triangle in the center, uh, and that's to emphasize the importance of school community collaboration and the ideas, the idea, as you all know, that uh, schools really can't do this job alone. It requires schools working hand-in-hand -hand with the community and uh, with parents, with community agencies, with business people in the community, so that everybody takes ownership in this issue because it is a community issue, not just a school issue. Um, and all of that really resulting in safe learning environments. And, and there we're talking about not only the, the physical envir environment being safe, but also the socio-emotional environment, the idea that schools are inviting places to be for kids that engage kids that are relevant in terms of the learning that occurs there, and that, um, that young people uh, want to go to those schools. The systemic renewal really is the whole planning process, and it, it is a keystone, really, um, to the effective strategies. Um, um, the idea of assessing where you are with respect to dropout prevention uh, in your district, really sizing up the situation, knowing where you are, identifying potential dropouts, and then, and then really systematically creating a long-range plan for dropout prevention. Um, where we've seen this happen, we've seen dramatic results. Um, as I said before, you can... You can take a mentoring program or, or um, any one of these other, um, either one of these other um, strategies that are in, in the basic core group and put those in place, and you're, you're, you will have an impact on, on some kids. But it's the long-range systemic planning, uh, planning ahead and long-range for how, what you're going to address with respect to the dropout issue and systematically putting those kinds of programs in place that really makes a difference. Well, well Sam, I'm, I'm glad you, you mentioned that because I don't know about you, but I'm often asked when I'm speaking or working with school districts, look, we've got limited resources. If we had to put a dollar 
in, in any particular place? Where would you spend that dollar? And I think you're making a point very clear that um, that uh, without the strategic planning piece, it's hard to know where to put that dollar. Absolutely. And that's not making uh, any comment either as to the importance of any of the other strategies. For instance, um, you could make an argument that you would put all your money in early childhood education, for example, which is where the problem um, begins. or it's, it's it's our best step to, toward prevention. We're putting all these resources into middle schools and high schools, and certainly we need them there. We have a lot of kids already at that level that need to be helped. But it is, but it's, you, as you said, Terry, it's, it's the planning, really, the long-range planning that takes into consideration all of these issues that you're trying to, uh, to address and then developing a systematic plan for doing that. And I think the other great thing about it is no two school districts or schools are alike. And you really have to look at your own community and your own school to see what your particular issues are with your students. And, and that's what happens in this early, um, in, this, in this systemic renewal phase. But enough from us, because we really feel that the best way to discuss um, each of these areas really is, um, you know, with letting you hear from people in the field who are actually doing this. Yes, and we have Deb Dillon waiting on the line here, chomping at the bit to share what happened uh, in her school district in Fargo, North Dakota. When we first met Deb, she was in charge of alternative program up there and was charged with doing some magic up there in Fargo, which she's going to tell us about right now, Deb's. Uh, principal, but um, we are also proud of her right now because she's a recent winner of our Crystal Star Award, so uh, we're very delighted to have you with us, Deb, and um, perhaps you could kind of share what your experience was with this uh, element of dropout prevention. Thanks, Marty. It's great to be with you. Um, We started on this adventure about seven or eight years ago. Uh, when our then superintendent, Dr. David Flowers, decided that this was an area we needed to really look at. We um, started by the first step I think you need to do is to gather your data to know what is happening in your community, what you need. And so that's where we began and could tell that even though we have a higher graduation rate than a lot of places, um, it still wasn't satisfactory for us. And so then we moved to a stage where we had to, um, secondly, face those facts that we encountered. And I think in many school districts, honestly, that facing the facts may be the most difficult step of all. Yeah, um, that's so true. So and, you, know, you, mentioned, times, you mentioned, Deb, um, that you uh, you have a, a relatively high graduation rate, um, we we can attest to that because when we first got the call from uh, from Fargo, really we wondered um, we wondered about that. Frankly, we, we've been working with districts all over the country that had a graduation rate far lower than that. And I remember that f- the first conversation I had with um, Dr. Flowers, and he said. Um, you know, yes, we've got a graduation rate of 80-some percent. I can't remember what it was exactly then. But that's not good enough for us. And I know that's your philosophy. It certainly is. I mean, and, and you, I know you've heard me say many times that until the graduation rate's 100 percent, I'm not going to be satisfied. So I keep working toward that end. Um, I may never quite reach it, but unless you put the goal out there, you won't get there. So um, anyway, one of the first things that we decided to do was once we had faced those facts and shared them, we weren't getting any kind of urgency behind the issue. Um, No one seemed for many, many years, the district figured we were graduating almost everyone. Our community wasn't concerned. So we did arrange for a PAR visit from the center, and that was a real catalyst for us. Um, And I, having been the alternative person for a number of years, I wasn't sure what you guys were going to be able to come in and tell me about our district, and yet it was so valuable to have that outside team come in. A, you saw things that we didn't see. And secondly, 
you had a cre- brought a credibility to the whole process that we could never have achieved without bringing in that outside agency. And so that was definitely a catalyst for us in moving forward on the process. Um, not only that, but what came out of that PAR visit was a list of 10 recommendations. And we did and still do use that then as a framework to help us build on what we need to do in our community. Uh, As Marty said, it's going to be different in every community. Uh, The things you need to work on aren't going to be the same things from one place to another. But the concept of having that framework will work no matter where you are. And I'm sure um, that... uh things didn't go quite as smoothly as you as you expected uh-huh. <laughs> and 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 certainly we don't want to give that that impression either this is a difficult no. process and I, I think you've made it that is. point and and what what were some of the barriers that you that you ran into well as i alluded to earlier one of the primary barriers we faced was simply a lack of recognition um of on the part of both people within the system and people in the community that we had an issue that needed to be worked on at all. Um, where these many of these school districts in other areas, that is not a problem they're going to have. But for us, it really was a barrier in moving forward. That's one also that I would say we have made significant progress in dealing with is letting the people within the district and in our community know that, A, it is a problem, and, B, we are working on it and that we all need to work on it together. Um, In spite of what news reports indicate, money is always (laughs) a barrier. (laughs) And I know that, on the whole, North Dakota is more stable financially than most states, but We aren't seeing much of the trickle down here, so um, being able to fund the things that we think are important is a continual uh, battle, and I think every school district encounters that. Uh, Yes, I'm absolutely certain of that. You know. I was wondering, Deb, you had so many um, ideas of things that you wanted to implement. How did you... um did you do you do it all at once, or how, what was your process for taking this information after you faced the facts, and okay. had, and her, tell us, take us from that point, what happened next? We did put together. First of all, we started with uh, some focus groups, uh, focus groups of staff, of students, of parents, and of community members looking at these areas and and getting feedback from them on what areas they thought were most important to tackle first or which ones might actually connect to each other, which was something that we found to be very helpful. We then developed a committee to really sit down and hammer out a, it was a five-year plan at that point. I'm I'm a planner. That's mm-hmm. what I do. And so uh, this group did put together a five-year plan. We did not try to do it all in one year. One of the things that I think makes us somewhat unique is the broad range of programs and initiatives that we have put in place, many of which cost us nothing or very little. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have we have quite an array of different things. But there was no way to institute that all in one year. Yeah, and that's an important point. That the, the, and that's the reason, really, for the kind of uh, systemic planning that you did. And, and, you know, as I was saying before, the importance of a long-range plan and mm-hmm. um, deciding on what's the most important thing to do first and then what builds on that and so forth and so on and, and um, bringing these strategies in as um, in accordance with that plan and, and, and in a way that uh, can make them most effective. 
Well, one of the things that I think was really valuable for us too, Sam, was that at least for a couple of years, I was able to focus strictly on this process. If you don't have someone who's in charge of shepherding the process, it's probably not going to happen. Yeah, that's a that's a that is an important point. It's a point you've made before. I remember back uh, you you did a radio webcast with us, and you you made that yep. point there. And and um, I do think um, I, I think you're absolutely right about that. And it can be a a person um, you know appointed by the school or takes on that responsibility at the school level or at the district level. But you but right. somebody needs to be focused on that issue. That's right. Yeah, and, and Deb, did you have any final uh, comments? Because I, one thing I would say I mentioned that you did a webcast, and I believe it was in January of like '09, um, where in a whole hour you took uh, listeners through this process. So I do recommend that those who are listening and interested in this, and I'm telling you, I'm getting some emails about this right now, uh, that people are interested in in having the same process in their district. Uh, but was there any final points you wanted to make before we? Um, Sadly, have to move away from you, but happily move on to our next segment. Any more points, Deb? No, nope, I think we've pretty much covered wow, it. Wow, we're well, good. Well, I, I will. <laughs> I will add that um, uh, my colleague Terry Cash here was uh, on that team with us, and he came back shivering. Uh, we thought that would probably be the last time uh, that he headed that way, and, and and that's true. I don't think he's been back in North Dakota, but he went from there to Alaska. <laughs> so apparently he got accustomed to the climate apparently there are no dropouts in hawaii <laughs> yeah, That's yeah we keep out. trying to find them there but um well, well we appreciate deb and she's had to hang up so we can uh, move yeah, on and, to the and, next uh, segment and let me just say we thank her for that deb i know you're still listening uh, that was a great testament really to um this whole idea of of systemic renewal and the importance of school community collaboration. And while you didn't touch on it, I know that one of the main things you were working on, too, was providing safe learning environments for for um, children. And the PAR process that you mentioned, um, we've done over and over again in many districts across the country. And what we're trying to do is to support districts also with our model programs database with new publications every year and and publications that really you can put to use to have information that you can use and put to use in the field and and new uh new web products to support uh, people in the field an example would be a new professional development series that we're developing so be on the lookout for that so while we know that we come in and and can do this assessment for you and give you good recommendations often the district you know really wants to take it from there and so we're trying to provide as many resources as we can to support that process and, and i think one of the things that's evolved over the years sam is is quite clearly the the gathering use of data, understanding of data. Um, quite frankly, uh, it's changed in the past six or seven years with regard to uh, data that are gathered, how we analyze those data and how we use them, early warning systems, et cetera. So it's become much easier, quite honestly, to help to inform the process once you have those data ahead of time and can before you even go in. Yeah, that's a yeah. great point. Too. Well, yeah, and I, th I think it's the whole thing about looking at my local school, my local district, this data really gets you down to what are your issues and what do you need to deal with. And this lens of the 15 strategies, which we're talking about today, really helps us identify what's going on. Um, well, Sam, I think we're moving on to the next segment, and I'll, I'll start introducing that. And this is one of my favorite areas, or I get to do it, and it's talking about early interventions. Uh, I love this because when I first came into this field of dropout prevention, I was thinking it was all about 16-year-olds who could leave school. Oh, little did I know that a dropout prevention starts really at birth. And uh, this is an area where we uh, certainly talk about the engagement of family support as being so key from early years onwards that the family uh, need, is to be involved. The research shows that uh, young people whose parents are involved in their education do better. And so how do we engage families? And this is a challenge out there, but this is one of the very important early strategies. I think one of the um, webcasts I want to refer people to is Parent-Child Home, Sam, if you remember Sarah Walser's program. Oh, absolutely. And it's, it's, 
It's, it's uh, w- one of the programs that I talk about all the time. There are many good programs out there. This one has a particularly strong research base, and it has to do with the importance of early communication between mother and child uh, at a very early age, yeah. uh, age two and three years old. And, and uh, it's uh, just a highly effective program. But, again, there are many programs out there, and, and the whole idea is, to, it is engaging parents as teachers of the children. Exactly, and starting them so early, that's what one of the, the benefits of that particular one. Uh, and we move on to early childhood education. Uh, this is before children even get to kindergarten, so there's lots of important things going in that area as well, and getting uh, children on the right pathway to graduation. And you th- hard to think about looking at a two- or three-year-old that this is something that needs to be thought about, but as we'll hear shortly, this is very important. And finally, reading. Reading is such a key thing, and early literacy development does start very early on, but it is through the early elementary grades where reading takes place. So these are three areas of prime importance because prevention is the best. um, Well, early intervention is the best prevention, or it's the best cure, and certainly the most cost-effective way to uh, do dropout prevention. But um, I love our... our, uh, uh, Listen, our, our presenter who's coming up next is Mary Caputo, who is one of our newer network members. We, we just talked to a Crystal Star winner who we've known several years, and Mary is wonderful. She d- edited our most recent newsletter. She's got 20 years of experience in the field, and she's, calls, she's calling in from Austin, Texas, and I am um, welcome you to the program, Mary. It's great to have you with us. Thank you so much, and thank you for that lead-up about early childhood, and I am just so grateful that this is on the table for national dropout prevention. It's wonderful. Well, can can you help us make this connection? Because we're going to have some other listeners out there who are very focused on secondary level, and they're saying, tell me, why why are you talking about dropout prevention in these early years? What can you you share with us from your many years of expertise in that area? Sure, absolutely. Well, I mean, for me, it kind of goes back, it starts with brain development. Um, We know that when uh, babies are born that there's, you know, hundreds and thousands of neurons, and as they experience and navigate their their world, um, connections are made. And, you know, those positive um, connections strengthen and and, and get solidified. We want to ensure that their experiences are positive and therefore carry on through their life to, to education. We know that the best way is through environment and relationships for the co- brain connections to work. So when we look at relationships, we are looking at those basic, basic core pieces of, of trust, of security, of nurturing, and these are all components of, of high quality um, education and start in life to be ready for kindergarten, as well as the environment, being exposed to um, different different things, different ideas. And it's not so much the academic piece, so that is important. It's not the worksheets that carry over so much, but rather the, the love of learning and the discovery, the, uh, learning how to discover into learning. And then the other big thing that I think is just so critical and so important is the social-emotional self-regulation. When I did a research project on um, just our school district, and it mirrored exactly the national trends, the number one issues teachers are facing in elementary is managing challenging behaviors. So that is something that goes up through the school system, and that is a concern as they get older and older is that self-regulation and for them to know that this, for the students to know school is a place for them to be. And that when we look at self-regulation, we have to understand there's lots of components to it. There's the, excuse me, there's the piece that is where your ability to regulate yourself, that you can regulate others and that you are other regulated. And what often happens is that kids who do, who sit and do their their work and don't make um, any fuss or demands, people think, oh, they have good self-regulation. But in fact, they have good teacher regulation. So an important component is to be able to not only be regulated by others, but to have self-regulation, and that transpires into initiation, collaboration, 
um, working in large groups, being able to work in small groups, um, cooperating, which in turn are what research shows the big companies are asking. Um, <laughs> they're they're um, you know, future employers. We need people who have these skills. And it really all starts in preschool then. It's learning to share the glue stick, you know? Share <laughs> <laughs> the glue stick, that's right. Yeah, sharing is a big thing. I mean, it really it is. Well, and it, 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 um, it is a big thing. <laughs> and it, it, it goes across all of life, <laughs> you know? And so those skills in particular really do translate to that outcome of college and career readiness. So you see that thread all the way through. Mary, one thing I want to ask you is um, one of the things that, that I know they're doing in Texas about getting every child's school ready. Mm-hmm. And um, so what does that actually mean when you say you want every child to be school ready? Well, um, we know that um, from some of the research that we're doing here in Texas that in particular our students who are at risk or from a lower SES um, status are not coming to, to kindergarten um, ready to learn basically and it's really not that they're not ready to learn it's that the schools aren't ready to teach them Mm. so I want to kind of shift that perspective from Mm -hmm. we as the institution need to be prepared for every child that walks through that door but um, one of the things um, the literacy piece is become huge Um, absolutely Um, we're trying to engage more and more opportunities for students to um, to have exposure to that reading piece, the parent involvement um, at all levels has become a, a huge focal point. We have an initiative now with United Way called Success by Six, and they are targeting a very specific population within our Austin area. And it's all it's throughout, but this is the one I'm most familiar with mm-hmm. is the Austin area one. And they are putting in some wraparound services where these children receive, um, they have partnerships with YMCA and counseling and the preschool so that the ch- it's kind of a one-stop shop. The parents have support, the kids have support, the teachers have support and kind of helps that whole system and not just a piece of the system. I feel like oftentimes we, we work in these little silos of, oh, that's preschool, oh, that's primary, but really it's a continuum of life systems that we need to look at we always need to look at that end result. Mary, um, what would be um, your experience in the research? What would it suggest a student coming to school, as you said, uh, maybe not school ready or the school not ready for them, but um, how long does it take to catch up to, to get a child uh, ready? And, and that really differs. Um, of course, individually with student to student and, and, and modifications. Now that Texas has implemented the response to intervention, um, the, the, the strategies and the tools are uh, in progress is assessed a little more often. So it really, in, in its best, it, it helps to really pinpoint the specific areas. I would like to really see the response to intervention even occur a little bit earlier um, in the preschool years just so that when a, when a child comes into kindergarten, if they're behind on a certain area, there's a difference between being behind on a certain area because you've never been exposed to it, rather than you're behind in a certain area, but your preschool teacher has been working with you for 10 weeks. Mm-hmm. And so that's the kind of information that really helps to plan for a child. You know, I was in uh, special education, so... We always have to balance that, you know, what is a disability, what is exposure, what is a develop, just developmentally. And so it's hard to say, you know, what the trajectory of, of time frame is. But, you know, what we have found is that once a child enters the system, once we can, can kind of pinpoint some key areas and work on those key areas, areas while, you know, celebrating and embracing the strengths, that is the best outcome. Well, I think um, one of the things I, I notice in your conversation about success by six, and we, we like to integrate all the strategies together. In the earlier cluster, we talked about school community collaboration, and, and you're just giving us an example right there where early childhood education 
can be integrated with parent involvement and community support. And and I just yeah, and also um, the uh, it goes back also to to systemic renewal of this mm-hmm. this planning process. What what do we need to change in the st- current structure of schools mm-hmm. that would better accommodate kids coming in at different levels? Absolutely. And, I mean, I think that's yeah. a tremendous point, um, a, a really important point, um, Mary. That um, the idea that the schools are not ready to teach um, to teach some children. Um, even more so than children are not ready for school. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that we tried to do is form partnerships with our area preschools. We found that 98%, not 98, I think it was like 80-something percent of our kids are coming from a preschool setting, Mm -hmm. either full-time or part-time. So we began partnering with our area preschools as well, offering, we always offer trainings, but even more so really partnering with them, not saying we're coming in as the expert and do it this way, but rather, what are your challenges? What are your belief systems? What's your culture? You know, this is what they can, they're going to expect, they can expect when they enter the public school. How can we bridge the transition so it's not so awkward and, and scary for the parents, and it's, for the children, it becomes seamless. Well, these have been some really good ideas and suggestions and and informing those of us who are um, not so familiar with early childhood, Mary. And and unfortunately, we have to kind of say goodbye to you now as we move on to our next cluster. But thank you for uh, joining us and appreciate so much your contributions, both with the newsletter, which I'll point out to our listeners, is online and under our newsletters. You can get the whole PDF of Mary's entire newsletter if you didn't receive a hard copy. Oh, and thank you. And thank you for such important work that you guys are doing. It is so appreciated and it is making a difference. It is impacting educators. I see it. Oh, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Thank, thank you for you. joining us. And I know for, um, I know for us here uh, around this table, and I'm sure for you listeners, um, this is a little frustrating because uh, we're just <laughs> glossing, uh, skimming the surface, really, of each of these areas. Um, hopefully that will whet your appetite, so because we've got many, many more programs planned, uh, in-depth programs, more in-depth, uh, on each of these topics as we've done for the past four years. We also want to hear from you, our listeners, about the programs that you want to hear more about, and that will help us structure these programs um, in in the future, but you know this whole area of um, early interventions is so important. It's always been on our table. It's always been um, not not just uh, um, it's one really important area. The fifteen strategies, yeah, uh, Terry. We talked earlier about <laughs> these first three overarching strategies, but really, the more you get into these strategies. There's no, there's not really one more important than the other, and you can't just implement one set of them and not, not really take a look at how they all fit together. And exactly. and so hopefully you're beginning to see why we created that first graphic as a way of showing you how these, how these strategies fit together, and that when you use them in a coordinated way and and an integrated way. Um, you're going you're gonna to be much more effective, really, with yeah. addressing this issue. They're all woven in, and we got someone else to weave into the program, Terry, I think. Well, we do, and uh, it's a pleasure. I get to talk about the, the basic core strategies, mm-hmm. and, uh, of course, that's an area that it's near and dear to my heart. But, you know, I want to go back to one thing. I've heard Dr. Smink say uh, many, many times, you know, there, there were 300 or more strategies and when we started looking at this, and we narrowed it down, you know, to 15. Um, but... These 15 clearly have a very strong research base behind them, and, you know, none um, more so than uh, the basic core strategies of mentoring and tutoring, service learning, alternative schooling, and, and after-school opportunities. And what I like particularly about these particular strategy areas uh, is that they're, uh, it's, they're dependent upon relationships and engagement at the heart of each of these strategies. Not to say that they're not with the others, but particularly with, with these basic core strategies. And, uh, w- again, we know that the research is, is very rich uh, for each of these strategies, and uh, um, there are countless uh, opportunities that I could describe in which um, I have worked in the field and, and had opportunity to see how these strategies Strategies um, worked independently and with other um, uh, with the other strategies. 
But if you look at mentoring and tutoring, clearly uh, mentoring, we have uh, advocated with the National Dropout Prevention Center and a, a mentoring, not your lunch bunny program, but a one-to-one adult long-term mentoring relationship. However, you know, some recent research that I've been involved with looking at peer-to-peer and looking at um, um, e-mentoring and other types of mentoring that work that work uh, equally as well. So, But mentoring in itself is, is clearly uh, a very effective um, uh, tool, and we, we often, one of the first things that we look at in the PAR process, what do, you have, what do you have in terms of mentoring? Well, tell me about it. What, how, are you, how are you recruiting? How are you training? Uh, there are many, many uh, facets of mentoring that, uh, pieces of it that folks don't quite understand. The same with tutoring, tutoring after school tutoring, before school tutoring. We know these things work, and um, and they are very important um, strategies for helping kids to get back on on track. And then I'm sitting here in the midst of uh, of probably the the one of the world's best gurus, if you will, in service learning, and uh, with Marty Duckenfield, who's probably forgotten more than most of us will know. Um, and I like to I like to term it as learning with service and um so service learning we know is uh we've seen many many opportunities around uh, uh for examples of how the the uh, the learning has been incorporated with service yeah learning with service is a um is a good way to put it because mm-hmm. that's exactly what service learning is a lot, many people understand the service component of it but not so much how that's connected with learning exactly a lot of misconceptions the same with alternative schooling. Unfortunately, if you go back and look at alternative schooling after Columbine, and uh, there were alternative schools, there's a plethora of alternative schools that spread up, basically for the uh, for protection and et cetera. And uh, and I hate to say this, but uh, sort of holding pens for uh, quote uh, bad kids. And but when we talk about alternative schooling, we talk about the Marianne Raywood model, the Type One model, which is a choice model. Which which provides small classrooms and and if you look in our um, in our readings and our um, our documents with regard to alternative school you'll see uh, you will see lots of air, lots of descriptions of what a what an effective alternative school should look like um, and then after school opportunities and this is after after school opportunities include those extracurricular activities that we know that uh, that kids need to be involved with so. Um, having said that as a, as a lead in our uh, our guest today the, dr rob schumer um, has uh, written extensively about student engagement as uh, it's quite an ex- uh, extensive background and he's worked with me in many of these areas and and so rob i'm going to bring you on board to just uh, sort of take it from here and talk about uh, uh, some of your work with regard to these pre- specific core strategies thanks thanks Terry. Uh- as I've said before, I think you know, uh, dropout prevention is more than just keeping children and youth in school. It's really about the vitality of a democratic nation. So we need to prepare young people to be citizens and family members, and lifelong learners, and certainly the 15 strategies help to accomplish that. But uh, you had asked me to talk about two areas, alternative schools and service learning, which are other core elements of uh, successful educational strategies. Um, alternative schools kind of a hard concept to describe, as you had mentioned. I had referenced a chart by Lynn Hartzler of California years and years ago, and he talks about 88 different kinds of alternative education models that are that are arranged in, in three categories. They're curriculum-based, they're form or structure-based, and student needs-based. And he goes on to say that there are even types of access, like mandated and limited options, and then ones where students have choices to attend. So I actually developed a magnet high school for LA Unified, which was a, a, a curriculum-based program, so kids who were interested in health sciences came there and uh, had an opportunity to uh, <clears throat> go to a medical center mm-hmm. every week as part of their schooling. But uh, clearly, you know, a form of structure school might be a year-round school or a school without walls, and, and then a student need-based school might be, you know, a multicultural school or an ethnic-based center. So the whole notion about alternative education is that, in a sense, the more alternative schools you have, the more opportunities you have to reach young people. And uh, most of them are alternatives to 
as you had mentioned before, Sam, traditional education where yep. people lecture and students don't have much input in what they uh, have to learn. But the second area that's probably more near and dear to my heart is in service learning. And, uh, you know, it's a model that really helps to connect young people with their community and give them something that's meaningful. And uh, I might call attention to listeners to, I think, one of the best uh, sources of information about dropout prevention and service learning, which is Engage for Success. It's a report from the Civic Enterprises Gates Foundation that kind of lays out the use of service learning for really involving students in learning. And they actually referenced two other publications, The Silent Epidemic and America's Civic Health Index, to try to make the case that, you know, when kids drop out of school, they drop out of society. They, they only vote. They're half as likely to vote as a college student and only 25 percent as likely to volunteer. So part of what service learning does, it's not only just about as you had mentioned, engagement. But it's about students really wanting to get involved in something that's really meaningful to them. In fact, in the silent epidemic, they said over 80% of the students who've dropped out said they would have stayed in school if they had an opportunity to do service learning. It was something mm -hmm. that was interesting for them and something that gave them a chance to do something that they felt they were contributing to their communities. I think there's something about service learning, Rob, that um, uh, doesn't feel like school. And uh, all of a sudden, they're up out of their seats. They're engaged to doing things that they care about, that they designed, that they figured out. And and how different that is than the traditional classroom. They don't. I don't think kids see it at school, but they are learning actually so much more when they're dealing or involved with something that's not like school. Sure, it's um, it's learning that is uh, relevant. They can see the relevancy of it. It's engaging. Um, and it also goes back to what we talked about um, a, a little earlier uh, with Mary about um, uh, it has to do with the way schools are structured in themselves so that they're, they're um, teaching students with, with different learning styles and at different levels. And um, so, it, yeah, this whole idea of engagement, I mean, again, as we go through these, I think it's a lot easier for people to see how they relate, one relates to the other, and, and mm -hmm. they all build on one another. But I think the, the research is pretty clear with service learning. There's an added dimension in that mm -hmm. it's not only engaging, but it, it gives students a sense of contributing to something. Yeah. Uh, and so there's a sense of pride. There's a sense of, of energy that they get that's unlike most experiences that, that they have in school. So I think that that's clearly one of the advantages you know, we have a, an article in our soon-to-be-published uh, journal that brings a term that I had not heard of before called mattering. Mm -hmm. And I thought, mattering, mattering. You know. And what it is is, you know, do I matter? And that this is a huge thing. And, boy, I thought, boy, does that connect to service learning? Because all of a sudden a young person sees that what they're doing makes a difference, that they themselves matter. Have you, have you heard that term before, Rob? Yes, yes. In, in, in fact, uh there's a, a new report from AAC and U, the American Association of Colleges and Universities, and their whole unit is on civic engagement. And it talks about the positive feelings that come from participating in, in service learning. Mm. So there really is this generation uh, of feeling that you have some level of importance. Uh, the service learning research suggests that you get a little more out of uh, working with people than you do necessarily with environments. They're both helpful, but yeah, interacting with people really, really matters a lot. And in fact, there, it's not just K-12. There's a study by George Koo uh, on the 10 high-impact educational practices in higher education. And, and guess what? They talked about collaborative assignments and projects and, and doing capstone courses. And yes, service learning and community-based learning make a difference. So it's not just in elementary and middle and high school. It goes all the way up the scale that uh, that when students get engaged in community work and they feel valued, that uh, it makes a big difference. You know, I think this hits one of those other R's, which is rigor. A lot of times people think, oh, service learning is in that sweet and nice kind of stuff. We're, you know, we're making doilies for people at the nursing home, and, and it's very nice. But that's there's no rigor to that. And yet, um, what you're telling me, and what you know we know here, but that service learning actually raises the bar 
on uh, the content area of what a student is learning as well. If they're doing it in colleges and universities, doesn't that say that to you? Well, it does, and, it, and when you mention the word rigor, uh, I had actually finished a six-state study in for the National Research Center on Career and Technical Education, and several people that I had interviewed uh, told me that I had it backwards. They said it's not rigor, relevance, and relationships. It's relationships, relevance, and rigor. Mm -hmm. And what service learning allows students to do is to develop relationships mm -hmm. with other students, with other people in the community. And once you get the relationships established, then you can develop the relevance of the learning and, and actually get into the subject matter and get to rigorous learning. Oh, here, 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 here. here. Yeah. What are you going to say? I think we all agree with that. And Terry wants to say something, <laughs> no. I know. Three words, well, right? Well, I'm, I'm going to go. I've always said it's <laughs> it's three. It's relationships, relationships, relationships. But, However, what I really wanted to say, Rob, it also suggests differing ways of assessment. And that is that is a, an area that we've, uh, we've probably um, not done as well on with regard to education as that we could have, uh, looking at uh, differing ways of assessing uh, student uh, growth and et cetera and et cetera and so service learning gives uh, gives opportunities really to have uh, different approaches to assessing student uh, student growth. So, uh, and one of, one of the major ways I support is students involved in assessing correct. their learning. Oh yes, that, and this the is assessment a, is a is a is a service itself. And Rob has a fantastic publication that he did for us, um, Youth as Evaluators, and. I recommend that you all find that in the Linking Learning for Life series. Shamelessly going to promote that one, but it's been fantastic in, in a reprint after reprint, so it's it's a good one. And and sadly, I said I keep saying after each of our presenters, we have to say farewell to Rob now um, and um, appreciate so much your uh, spending you know the last 15 minutes or so with us and with our audience today because you brought to light some of the very important basic course strategies. So Thanks to Rob, and um, we're going to say goodbye to him now. And um, kind of, you know, one of the things yep. that we were short on in this category, I've just got to say it, is, is the after school part, Terry. I wanted to just mention um, summer learning as, as part of it as well. I mean, definitely that is where that would fit in. We did do a, a webcast a year or so ago with our friends at the National Summer Learning Association, and what I learned from them is about the summer learning loss, which is over accumulation of years, very dramatic um, that there's three grade levels of reading that is lost by ninth grade due solely to summer learning loss. And I think this is something that we really need to be aware of. Enriching summer experiences, it doesn't necessarily have to be summer school, but some enriching summer school learning uh, opportunities makes makes a big difference. Well, I, so. I think you're right, Marnie. I, I, unfortunately, it often becomes political in nature in terms of that uh, suggests changing, redesigning our schools and et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, but your point is well made. It doesn't, doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be school. It could be community it could. Uh, collaboration as well. Right. So um, anyway, that was just something I wanted to add. But that, that's a that's one of my favorite clusters. I guess they're all my favorite clusters because I said I liked early intervention. Now I really like that one too. So what do we got coming next? Well, quick recap. Um, so far, we've looked at the importance of systemic renewal, and you can see um, how important that is because uh, these, these, these strategies look simple on paper, but there's so much embedded in each one of these. And the whole concept of systemic renewal is really assessing um, where you are, your students, using data to do that, identifying dropouts, and then... Um, using these strategies to create long-range plans that involve school and community that create safe environments. And then the other groupings of strategies that we've covered, uh, the, the so important um, early interventions and, and how we uh, put programs in place uh, and systems in place and change schools in those early grades um, to accommodate um, children, these uh, important basic core strategies um, that that we see um, at use in many, many schools now and, and variations um, of these. Um, and now we come to um, this whole area of making the most of instruction. Um, how important is this category? Um, you know, if we don't um, change the way we're doing things, and both in the structure of schools and the structure of our classrooms, 
we're just going to continue to do things the way we've done, and and those are in accordance with old paradigms that don't necessarily um, fit the the children that are, that are coming into schools um, now. Terry, you mentioned earlier how things have changed over the past five or six years, and we see it, you know, out in the field. This is a new mm-hmm. generation of kids. Not only the uh, the issues of of riskness, but just in the way that they learn. Um, and so here we're talking about the importance of professional development. And when we talk about professional development, we mean um, high quality, we mean long range, we mean uh, we uh, peer led. Um, what we don't mean is uh, that professional development is a couple of days at the beginning of the school year and maybe a day or two at the end. Uh, with maybe one one or two sandwiched in between, but real professional development that's teacher led, that's res- that is active research, that is uh, that follows all of the of the standards really of uh, learning forward or formerly the National Professional Development Association, um, and that is meaningful and that brings about um, real change because teachers buy into it and and are a part of it. Um, the areas of active learning, educational technology, individualized instruction, all those are, those are all separate and have uh, could each be discussed separately. Um, they, too, have to do with engagement and relevance, relevancy of learning. I, I recently uh, visited a local um, college, college in South Carolina, Newberry College, where uh, we're involved uh, with uh, the the. Uh, with them in uh, what what's building what's called an engaged classroom, and um, while there may be some aspects of that engaged classrooms that are, um, that um, I may not fully agree with, um, it certainly made use of technology. It uh, well, one of the things that really impressed me was that while many schools are confiscating cell phones and and that becomes a discipline problem for kids, in this engaged classroom there were just many, many ideas about how you use those cell phones in the classroom. Um, uh, You know, quizzes that are given and they text, you know, answers in. Um, So in other words, the point is that uh, whether you agree with that or not, that there is all this technology that uh, young people today are uh, grew up with or accustomed to using, and then they enter school and suddenly th- they can't use that. that. In fact, that's a discipline problem. That that's creating a problem really when we should be making use of that technology. Yeah, and teaching. you know, and I think that term that we learned about from Doris Settles um, a year or so ago on that webcast about digital natives. Yes, that's the world <laughs> that they come from. We are the digital immigrants, and we struggle. <laughs> but um, there I'm we all. We, we, but I think at the heart <laughs> of that, though, Sam. You you're exactly right. Is is um, how do we learn how to do that? How do we how, how do we have the professional development in place to make to ensure that it's used effectively? Well, our, our guest in in this area really, um, Pat O'Connor, and we're really happy to have him. He is a Pat's a professor at Kent State, and his um, he's got a lot of interests, but his his uh, one of his main areas of interest is in uh, career technical education and adolescent literacy. And um, CTE uh, has been a real interest of ours also. We've had a major um, research project going with the National um, CTE Research Center um, looking at um, this whole idea of programs of study, um, which uh, Pat will talk about some, which is aligning uh, aligning programs, um, you know, to lead toward uh, careers, um, earlier career uh, exploration um, individual graduation plans as early as uh, middle school, things that give um, uh, students uh, direction and and, and relevancy for what they're learning, and so many other aspects of CTE, really, in terms of engagement that that, uh, uh, we feel career technology education um, is is a big um, strategy for for dropout prevention. But um, Pat's a recent uh, Crystal Star winner. and has written some books uh, for us or and with us uh, on this subject. And, Pat, we're really happy to have you with us today to give us your insights and reflections on this area. Well, it's always nice to be with uh, you and uh, uh, Terry and uh, Marty as well, Sam, so I'm happy to have a chance to, uh, to visit with you. Great. Talk to us a little more about uh, career technology education, what you've been engaged with with that and how you see that as uh, as not only keeping kids in school, but um, but really um, preparing them for 
the, the careers that they're, they, they may be facing. Well, I thought it was interesting that Mary Caputo mentioned the importance of college and career ready and uh, career technical <laughs> yeah, education. Yeah, her, her, her. That was a surprise, <laughs> but, a, but a nice one. Yeah, well, but, you know, that really says it very well because it is much of schooling is oriented toward what we're going to do for the, you know, a major portion of our lives as adults, and that's going to be spent at work. So uh, we all have a heavy investment in that. And, you know, career technical education historically was very much about the immediate employment for high school youth that were non-college bound. And um, it has kind of morphed into a much broader uh, enterprise in recent years because we recognize that young people need more than what we can give them in high school to be ready for the kinds of careers that we have in a global kind of uh, economic world that we're all living in. So career technical education has broadened uh, somewhat to connect more with post-secondary types of programs and many students even in high school career tech programs now are getting college credit that they use to help them matriculate into post-secondary education. So we, you know, we see a broadening of the goals and purposes of, of career technical education in response to the many changes that are happening primarily in the workplace. Well, I'm going to bring up something that I want to talk with you about because uh, you've played such a role in, with us over the years in promoting adolescent literacy. And um, we do find when we go into schools that um, ninth graders have a problem with reading and it gets worse as they go through high school trying to learn content. So, right. I mean, can you kind of connect all that to CTE? Sure. The, uh, you know, the whole notion is, as you all know, reading is a critically important part of a student's success in school. And if they struggle in reading, then they're more likely to get on a at-risk or a dropout kind of path. And um, the adolescent literacy part is where, you know, things seem to separate for a lot of kids. And uh, many of the kids who do struggle sometimes they go toward a career tech route. Uh, and I think a lot of people, the intention there is that much of career tech is an engaged, uh, lively learning environment and more hands-on learning and more realistic, more contextual. And a lot of kids, you know, connect with that better. But yet they still need to have strong reading skills uh, in a career tech program because so much of what's expected in the workplace is going to demand that. So. Um, it's well, Pat, what do you, what do you think, for everybody. Yeah. Pat, what, yeah. um, um, from your experience, what do we need to be doing in education to bridge this gap a little bit better between the CTE and, I mean, there's a lot of verbs, a lot of language talking about bridging the gap between college preparation and CTE preparation, but we don't see a lot being done, quite frankly, uh, just some rhetoric. And so, and, and I know there are some examples, but uh, from your perspective, how would, what would you suggest that a school district, uh, you know, uh, could could better bridge this gap between CTE and, or, or maybe there's not a gap. Maybe there's maybe there's another way of looking at it. You mean as far as going moving from high school into post secondary? Well, I'm saying that often children, students at ninth grade, uh, counselors sort of counsel them into college prep or one. Uh, one strand or another, and whether we like it or not, we see that all along. Well, maybe you're maybe you're not ready for college. Maybe maybe you should be going into this field and that field. And and quite frankly, you made the point that uh, CTE is is not necessarily um, disenfranchised from college, and uh, you know, four year college, and that they're 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 really. Uh, from my perspective, there should be a bridging of that. There should be a combination of skills and courses and et cetera um, be- between the two. They shouldn't be dissimilar or disaggregated between the two. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, and I, Terry, I think that it is starting to blend more together because of the increased expectations for academic competencies in the workplace. Um, more and more career tech programs are getting more academic in nature, if you will. We're also starting to see a lot of academic programs that are taking on more of a career focus. I'll give you a good example, uh, biotechnology. Mm-hmm. Uh, that many science programs are shifting more to a biotech kind of a framework that helps to prepare young people with science backgrounds, but prepare them for the workforce in science. So you're no longer just teaching biology, but you're preparing people for the biotech workforce. And in that respect, that science program has become more contextual and it's more alive. So I think you're seeing movement from both ends, from an academic end and a career tech end, they're kind of merging mm-hmm. together. And, 
not to get too too theoretical or philosophical on us, but you know, this is really what John Dewey's whole concept of experience education mm-hmm. was about almost a hundred years ago. That we really didn't do that uh, in career tech and vocational education. We we kind of separated academic and vocational. I think We're one of the them blend yeah. together. One of the best ex- uh, examples of, that I've seen around the nation would be at, uh, St. Paul Public Schools with their connected counseling um, mm. uh, 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 program there, and they are indeed uh, looking at this uh, whole notion of of counseling students and and with job preparation, uh, regardless of uh, trying to point you in a particular direction, but rather point you in a particular skill area and strength area mm-hmm. of yours. Yeah. And so. Yeah, that that's a great um, program. That was a six-year plan, and I think we actually have on the uh, webcast a, a video with a counselor there taking you through that process. I just just remembered that, and that that was an excellent part of really what CTE is all about, too. Yeah, and I, I think we I think we are seeing some movement in that direction. Maybe not as um, as quickly as we'd like to see it, but I think the whole concept of um, programs of study. Um, The alignment of courses, both academic and CTE courses, um, have a lot more kids taking CTE courses. um, uh, Well, I think it's it's a value-added thing, Sam, from my perspective, because you're adding um, academic and and, um, career skills together, and then you're aligning that with post-secondary, and many of the jobs we see in the future are what we call the middle skill occupations, which are oftentimes requiring an associate type degree at a community college or technical institute or some uh, facility of that sort and the programs of study move students into that kind of uh, place and and that's a good spot because there are a lot of really good job opportunities in those middle school occupations so that's that's something that's uh, very positive uh, for all of us well pat thank you uh we know that there's uh um, f- far more than we've been able to um, cover in this brief period of time to, to cover with this area. We, we um, appreciate you being with us um, today and giving us uh, your insights. Um, and thanks really to all of our presenters today. Um, I hope for you listeners this has been as uh, informative and enjoyable a program as, as it has for us, um, celebrating our um, our history and, and really looking at the 15 strategies and, and doing that by hearing uh, from voices in the field. Um, but we're out of time today. Yeah, we are. And I will say I'm sitting here because I check the emails um, constantly to make sure that there's no questions. But what I've been getting endlessly are comments from people who are appreciative of the various things that were shared and, and want some more resources that we will give later. Obviously, this is touching a lot of people out there. So uh, we, we do appreciate our listeners, and we also definitely appreciate those presenters out there who brought to life these um, some of the elements of our 15 strategies. It's a huge topic, isn't it? <laughs> well, clearly there wasn't enough time to really, you know, to accept to scratch the surface, and we knew that. But uh, hopefully our listeners will, um, uh, uh, will have gained uh, – some understanding from this and have gained opportunities to look for um, uh, other areas of discovery and et cetera with regard to the 15 strategies. Yeah, and we hope that this has given you a good picture, really, just an overall picture, a broad stroke of all the strategies and how they relate to one another and work together. So as we continue these radio um, uh, broadcasts in in the future and we're concentrating on one strategy, um, and, and and you'll see how important that strategy is, but we want you to keep in mind, really, that it, that one strategy fits among a group of strategies, yeah. and the most effective way to implement is um, is is by with an, with integrating these strategies. Weave them all together, I would say. Weave mm-hmm. them all together. Weave them all together. Yeah, this this program has been kind of fun. I think uh, it's very different. I I think maybe we'll have to do something like this again, but. Um, celebrating the 25 years has been really good. So um, at this point, I like to remind the listeners um, that this radio webcast, like all the ones we have, will be archived on the website in the next few hours, and you'll be able to download it onto your iPod or your MP3 player, and you can listen to it forever and ever. But uh, we also recommend that you might want to use it as professional development. What a great setup this is, Sam and Terry, for for schools who are looking at making change to hear the 15 strategies collectively and then when they 
do that assessment, they have resources on this website that will take them to drill down so they can effectively implement and learn more about a particular strategy. So Yes, Marty, and also remind our listeners that we're trying to take this a step further. This, this has been so successful, and we've had so many comments about how helpful these are that we really um, have begun to um, take these webcasts and use them as a focal point, really, in a whole professional development series that we're doing that surrounds these webcasts with many, many more resources, with an implementation guide. So begin to look for those. We think those will be very, very, very helpful in your professional oh, And being self-promoting, as always, let's promote those. There's one on mentoring, which you heard Terry speak so eloquently about, and relationships, which is relationships, relationships. Um, those two DVDs are ready for you now, so check those out on the website in the professional development series. So, um, yeah, um, by the way, you know, we're on iTunes, and I always have to kind of just stop and just pause and wallow in that feeling that, we're going to be on iTunes again. So subscribe to Solutions, and you'll get to hear all the, the monthly webcasts again and again. So we'll be returning to our usual format next month. Um, we've got a variety of excellent programs planned for you, so please mark your calendar for Tuesday, November the 29th, 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the next Solution Broadcast. Thank you, all of you, for listening and participating over these years. Thank you for celebrating this 25th anniversary with us. And remember that we know why students are dropping out of school, and with these research-based solutions, we can assure that all of our students graduate. Join us next time for more Solutions to the Dropout Crisis.